So a very warm welcome uh, to Diana. Uh, and as Maria said, we're marking um, International Justice Day today, although the official day is tomorrow, which is um, 17th July is the date it, the um, uh, relevant uh, adoption of the Roman statute took place. So Diana, to start us off, um, you've worked at a various international hybrid and internationalized court. So uh, to help all of us, um, could you uh, give a short background in a few minutes of where we are today? Yeah, so just to explain a little bit the history, we kind of think of international criminal law starting after the Treaty of Versailles, where the allied powers set up uh, the Nuremberg and Tokyo community Tribunal, so Nuremberg 45 to 46, Tokyo 46 to 48. Um, and that's where a lot of the law about war crimes and the crime of aggression um, comes from. The next really major development was in 93 and 94 with the ICTY, the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia and the ITTR, which of course is still ongoing today with the residual mechanism. And they were set up by a Security Council resolution and since then, there have been various hybrid and international and internationalized courts. But of course, then the next major thing was in 2002, the permanent court, the International Criminal Court, um, which originally had jurisdiction for genocide, uh, crimes against humanity and war crimes, but now also has jurisdiction for the crime of aggression. But of course, that has limited jurisdiction to those who are member states, either the citizens of a member state or the crime occurs on a member state, or it's a referral from the Security Council, or um, a state self-refers. And therefore, um, there are lots of other tribunals, for example, the Special Court for Sierra Leone, and also, of course, that's temporarily limited to after it's set up or the, first, uh, the state joins. There's the Extraordinary Chambers for, the, for Cambodia, which is still ongoing. There's the Special Tribunal for Lebanon, where I worked, um, which is still ongoing, and that re obviously relates to the international crime of terrorism, um, and that's a hybrid court. There's the War Crimes Chamber in Bosnia-Herzegovina. There's the current Kosovo Specialist Chambers, which have recently um, issued indictments, which is where I worked. But there's also, for example, I worked within the Kosovo system, which was an internationalized system. <laughs> And there is also the special court um, in the Central African Republic. Um, and then there are other ways of prosecuting, for example, universal jurisdiction cases. We see some of the Syria cases being prosecuted in countries like Germany and Sweden. And then we had our own unique internationalized um, court when after the Lockerbie uh, bombing, we changed the law in Scotland so that it could sit in the Netherlands and without a jury to have that tried there. So a lot still going on, but it's important to also note um, the ability to, for national courts to try universal jurisdiction cases, which we've had, for example, Charles Taylor's wife being tried here. And that's the idea that something's so serious that even if something somebody's not your citizen or it didn't occur in your territory, you should still try it if you can't extradite somebody or there's no other way of that person being tried. So there's a great deal of international criminal law going on today and that is our two-minute um, history, if I can put it that way. All right, thank you very much. So the, the, the Syria and Myanmar inve international investigation mechanisms, and those are new, could you explain how they're different and why they're needed? Yeah. So they're very interesting. So one of the difficulties with international criminal law is quite often by the time everybody's, everything's settled enough to set up and agree who's got jurisdiction, who's going to investigate and have a proper criminal investigation, it's a long way after the event. So you don't have fully trained criminal lawyers, investigators, analysts, um, collectively investigating a situation which normally means a country and understanding informed consent uh, and all these things you need. Um, now in Syria the ICC does not have jurisdiction. It's never going to get a Security Council resolution because of Russia and um, China will block it and there's not going to be a self-referral uh, situation. But political wills change and also people from Syria go and work elsewhere. So what they've done is they set up 
a residual mechanism, that can do a full investigation, that can take informed consent as to who those witnesses are prepared to have their statements taken over, and they can do full analysis of the crimes, whoever they're being committed for, by. Now, Myanmar is a bit different because, as we know, the ICC is looking at whether they can have jurisdiction because Pakistan, is it Pakistan? No, Bangladesh is a signatory, and they're saying the crime of um, dis forced displacement is occurring in Bangladesh because the Rohingya are being pushed into Bangladesh. Now, that's very controversial, but certainly in relation to many of the crimes, they are occurring in Myanmar. And at the moment, who's going to have jurisdiction, who can prosecute it isn't clear. But you've got professional prosecutors uh, with international experience collecting evidence to an international standard, which is likely to be admitted because it's reliable in the courts and having consistency. Because one of the problems is when you have journalists, human rights organizations, etc., taking the first statements, they, they don't necessarily do it systematically with a view not only to establishing the crime base, but also the linkage and the structure and going after the highest people or establishing ID, they're often trying to tell a story and highlight something. They sometimes amalgamate um, what people say. So for example, I've, I've gone and looked at effectively a statement which is from the whole village and that taints people. And they often don't go into the same details and accuracy and look at permission to disclose. So you might not be able to, a prosecutor might not be able to get that from a journalist because they protect their journalistic sources. So effectively, the investigation has been set up with a view to working out who's going to try these trials later and having informed consent to know who the witnesses are prepared to have their details. And it's actually an extremely positive force because it gets around a lot of the problems you come along if you go in 10 years late. Thank you very much. So I'd like to ask you, in your experience, what the advantages and disadvantages are of international courts as opposed to internationalised domestic systems. And perhaps you could draw out the difference between those two first, please. So what you can have is a country, let's say Sweden, uh, prosecuting something under international jurisdiction or a country, let's say um, Gaddafi being tried in his own country. Now, if a, court, a country does it itself, quite often it's seen as political, it's seen as victor's justice. So one way around that is to bring in international judges, international prosecutors, and have them either sitting all alone or beside your own investigators and prosecutors in a, um, maybe two international judges, one local maybe, um, overseeing that in your own system. A hybrid court is something like a special tribunal for Lebanon when I worked, whereby we had local Lebanese law, we had international procedure, um, and we had a mixture of local and international just judges, and we sat in uh, The Hague, and then a truly international court is something like the ICC, which just applies international law and international uh, procedure. So I think to give an example, the the great thing about an internationalized system, where it's possible, where it's not possible, I had to against heads of state because then you're it's just not security wise possible is you have access to the police forces the infrastructure and everything around you which means things can happen faster um, your arrest warrants happen that day your search warrants happen the day after you you're not wa waiting weeks or, or months uh, for anything to happen um, but you also can stick on your international hat when you need to. So for example, when I was in Kosovo, um, we often needed to liaise with the Serbs um, in relation to suspects or joint investigations because maybe the witnesses were in Kosovo, uh, the suspects were in Serbia and the other way around. And Serbia and Kosovo don't recognise each other. But we were able to work something out because we were EU prosecutors, but I was also uh, Kosovo. I was admitted as a judge, but their judges and their prosecutors are hybrid. And I could do that. And I could also have the perceived independence of being an international prosecutor. And also, I couldn't be intimidated in the same way. For example, Hashim Thatchi, the now president, then prime minister, was criticizing me on Facebook for one of my indictments in relation to witness intimidation 
of one, one of his, an international journalist. A friend of mine had people marching against his indictment and people out on hunger strike against his um, indictment. A local prosecutor could not be expected to withstand that kind of pressure. But on the flip side, I did a case where at first instance, two defendants were found not guilty of rape as a war crime. I appealed this verdict, it was a judge's verdict with reasons, and the appeal court convicted them and sentenced them to eight and 10 years. Um, they were Serbian. Kosovo is a very small country. It's about two to three million people and about the size of Wales. So I had to get hold of them before they crossed the border to Serbia, otherwise justice would not be done. They would never be extradited back. Now, that wouldn't work um, with an international tribunal because it would take forever. And what had also happened, which was very unfortunate, is the appeals court had failed to attach an arrest warrant to their judgment. I phoned them up and they said, oh, you need to get the first instance judge to do that. But needless to say, the first instance judge was not very happy that his acquittal had been overturned and replaced with a conviction. So being inventive international prosecutors, you pick up the procedural code, it's codified. And as a prosecutor, I have a power of arrest now. That power of arrest is in the section of the code entitled pre-trial, but there was nothing saying I couldn't issue an arrest warrant at this stage. It was badly drafted. But the second, of course, they were in prison, which they were within, I think, 40 minutes of me issuing that arrest warrant, um, their detention was legal. And they being Serbian, getting the local police to go and knock down their door was not difficult. And Equally, when I wanted to do covert measures, have a large number of people come and bash somebody's door, that was fairly easy to do. Um, the difficulty is that if you are investigating the president, then, or somebody at the top in power, um, the prisons are porous, they have the entire intelligence service against you. Um, witnesses can be intimidated. Getting witnesses out is very complicated and difficult. And that's when being remote is important. And when communities are very tight and families are very large, it's sometimes easier to be an international tribunal with very few local staff. Um, so for example, when I was in Kosovo, the person who had the indictment marched against his defendants ended up not so much in prison as a doctor said they were all sick and had to go to a hospital. Um, this hospital was in the middle of the capital. Um, the people um, immediately apparently took over various doctor's offices, installed phones, were running business as usual. Um, and at one point they barricaded the hospital and rumour is they may have left and we had to negotiate to get back in. So there are huge security issues when you are investigating heads of state for crimes and then keeping them in prison afterwards. But in terms of actually quickly being able to do things, an internationalised court system often works and a hybrid system works where, for example, in Lebanon, I was able to summons members of Hezbollah to attend the Justice Palace or um, through that internationalized system which meant high-ranking politicians had confidence in us we had the deputy prosecutor was Lebanese and she was able to set up meetings which as a pure international uh, court would have been more tricky and that had the advantages of being able to harness um, the local um, forces when we needed it to find witnesses without um, the requirement to permanently reside in Lebanon, which given the reach of Hezbollah, um, which is of course a political party there, as well as um, providing security and having um, other forces and other sides to it, um, that was the right solution in those circumstances. Okay, thank you very much.
So I want to um, move on to the sex and gender based violence crimes and I wondered if you could start off by describing what the current challenges are facing international investigations for these. And I think you often, you can I just say for the acronyms, um, so it's, it is the SGBV you often say, but sex, sex and gender based violence. Yes, sex violence. and gender based violence. So unfortunately the challenges are the same as they've always been. And every time you go to an international conference on this subject, you seem to be saying the same things. But I would say one of the biggest challenges with international investigations is firstly, understand the culture and understand who you're talking to. And if you don't understand that, don't do it. Um, in this country, in the UK, we reckon 85% of rapes are not reported and only a tiny percentage of that go to trial. Imagine if the fact your rape means you can't be married, you will be thrown out of your community, you will be shunned. Um, so that's one thing to understand. And there were certain ways of combating that. So, for example, in relation to the Yazidis, in relation to, the, in relation to Bosnia, um, you, you immediately contact uh, the religious leaders if you understand the context. And, for example, in Bosnia, they said the rapes of the Bosnian women were um, an attack on Islam, so these people were to continue to be regarded as virgins. In Rwanda, the local tribal leaders were contacted to make sure that these women were not thrown out by their communities. And once that was agreed, the number of um, reports increased. Now, I'm going to say something about men and boys in, in a minute, don't worry. Um, but also, you need to understand the culture for other reasons. So for example, when I first turned up, there were a large number of, st in Kosovo, statements taken by local NGOs. And you read a statement saying, Serbs came to our village, they shot these people, they beat the men, um, they killed these people, and then they forced me to serve them food and wine. You're like, well, that is not so bad, really. Why is this even in the statement? Mm. But if you go to all the local restaurants, you would see that in the Kosovo Albanian restaurants, though sometimes the women would work in various roles, they would never serve you at the table. And what you need to understand is that a woman serves her husband and her family only. And when they said the Serbs made me serve them food and wine, they meant the Serbs raped them. It was an acceptable way of communicating that. And if you didn't understand the culture, if you just rolled in there, can you still hear me? I can. Your screen's frozen, but just keep going. I can hear you fine. You still there? We might have lost her for the moment. All right, we'll only take a moment for her mm. to, to come back in. Shall we send her a quick email? To, I'm sure she'll just rejoin really anyway. I'm sure. Yeah, just for the audience, I know there's quite a lot of acronyms here. So obviously I've had the advantage of chatting with Diana in advance, but we can certainly um, send those around afterwards, couldn't we, Maria? Uh, I think that would help. Absolutely. I know, that, I, mean, some of, I know that some of you are really know this area and some don't. So, I, and Diana's talking about the ICC all the time as well. And that's the International Criminal Court, of course, which is, uh, you know, in the in the history of courts, relatively new. I think uh, there's so many of these long um, titles you need to you that you you get used to um, abbreviating. I think in these fields. Oh, there she is coming in now. Great. Fantastic. Yep. Hi. Hi. Really Hello, sorry. Hello, Diana. Don't worry at all. These things happen. And uh, I'm sure it's even more difficult in some of the circumstances that you've been talking about. So oh, we we're just technology. having a, no, no worries at all. Where, where did I cut out? 
Um, well, you were you were talking um, about what about the culture um, and how important food and wine. Is if you turned up and didn't know that, okay, yeah, you've got that, that might be used. All right, then I'll just speak very briefly about men and boys. So quite often, getting men and boys, in, especially in certain cultures, to admit that sexual violence or rape has occurred is exceptionally difficult, and uh, they'll just deny it occurred at all. Um, but if you talk to them about being tortured, that torture might involve having a broom handle stuck up their bum. That's quite an easy way for them to talk about it. And especially in detention centre settings, um, that happens a lot and it's easier for them to talk about it that way. And sometimes it's more acceptable for the community to charge it that way. And what's quite interesting is, so we have the crime base, which is all the crimes occurring, and then it's linking it. And when we went to the Global Summit for Ending Sexual Violence, um, we were talking about really you should think that sexual violence is highly predictable. You turn up, you rape, murder and torture um, and pillage, sorry. Um, but lots of people think, well, it's just something men do, which is very insulting to the men in our lives. But um, we know that commanders are using sexual violence systematically as a weapon of war. Because then, of course, it, it's a form of genocide, it's a form of uh, demoralizing um, a, a citizen, the, the a civilian population. Um, but what's interesting is if you have men being sexually abused in a detention center and you classify it as torture, everybody thinks that's something you can pin on commanders. So when looking at sexual violence, quite often you have to use the command responsibility model. Um, in that they're on notice and they did nothing to stop about stop it um, in order to prosecute people um, to show the linkage from what occurred upwards and and it's often just convincing people that you can hold commanders responsibility for widespread sexual violence um, that is challenging but that is something that's becoming more and more acceptable okay thank you very much that's really interesting and of course, we can't have a, an evening without talking a little bit about COVID-19, coronavirus. What's been the impact of that on international justice? Well, let's talk about the impact on international crimes first. So at the moment, governments and places that hold territory are getting a lot more power. They're getting a lot more knowledge about their citizens and their movements and they're getting a lot more control of their borders and who goes in and out. But you add to that that the journalists and the human rights defendants are locked down and not moving around so much, and that human rights are being eroded with our permission because most rights, not torture, are derogable, and at the moment there is a public health emergency. Then you add to that that lots of people are dying. So there is a, this is a great time to commit abuses and cover them up um, and we know that various things are happening so what is being done and what can be done well international travel is down restricted more difficult um, there are some remote interviews happening but you don't always know who's in the room so if you are an organization like many are which have some people in country you can have one person in the room whilst the investigation continues. You can have people giving evidence within a country if you can get them safely to a courtroom. There are some apps like the Eyewitness app, which are very good at helping people record atrocities and date and um, stamp them in terms of location so you can choose, prove it's um, happening. So what, what's happening is, is very hard to investigate. It, there's a lot of new crimes being committed. Um, there's less international cohesion, so the ability to condemn and deter these crimes is damaged. And of course, the pandemic is going to negatively impact the economy, which impacts funding. And to investigate these international crimes, you need money. So whilst international criminal lawyers are doing their best during the pandemic, this is a very difficult time. And if you just need to look at what's happening in Mexico, where uh, some of the local drug lords or whatever you want to call them, gangs, are killing people who are breaking COVID-19. Well, 
Are they breaking COVID-19? Are they one of your historic enemies? So it's, it's, very, it's a very difficult time for international criminal law at the moment and for human rights defenders, and it makes people much more vulnerable. We've been rounding up criminals we haven't been able to find during the lockdown. If you wanted to round up human rights defenders, it would be far easier. And then equally, when you want as an international lawyer to go and see witnesses quietly with nobody knowing, well, now is not the time to do it. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, it's obviously um, a, a really difficult area of law that you're working in. So this is a slightly odd question. What, what would you say is the most difficult part of working as an international prosecutor? Um, for me, it's all the people you can't help. In any case, let's talk about what we're really doing. If you look out your window to a moderately sized town, you have hundreds and hundreds of police uh, policing that. When we had the news of the world scandal, we had 100 police per year just on that investigation. That's not the level of resources you get for any of these big international investigations. If you look at the ICC, they probably have, I'm guessing, 10 investigators on a whole country. Or even when we were at the Kosovo Tribunal, Lebanon Tribunal, like at the Kosovo Tribunal, we were looking at all the crimes committed during the war, which you can link up, where obviously far more crimes are occurring and over us or not just during the war from 98 onwards um, but and against large numbers of people across a whole country and you have very limited resources the result is you cannot give everybody justice you can't mm. you can say them well your son was one of the 90 people who died that went towards holding the very top person just it to account but you, the person who shot your son in the head we decided we didn't have time to prosecute him or we referred him to a local court and you have to engage like in Rwanda they've dealt with Kakacha courts etc you, you have to sometimes look witnesses in the eye and say we don't know who shot them um, it's one death I sorry there's no lead it's 12 years later I'm probably not going to be able to do anything other than listen to you. And actually, for lots of the witnesses, you can't give them a prosecutor's time because you have such limited resources. And they might have had their whole village wiped out, but you're prioritizing the investigation where 200 people died and you've got a link up to a commander. So I think that's one of, on a personal level, the most heartbreaking and difficult part. We all want to do more but you have to be realistic and um, limited in what you do. Um, secondly, there's lots of technical difficulties. Linkage is the most difficult usually, um, linking the crime base up to your individual defendant and prioritization. You have limited resources, so where are you going to prioritize? Which crimes are you going to pick? It's normally, Done by which ones you think you're going to be able to link but then you get the insider witness who's going to link other ones and you investigated wrong you have to go back and do the crime base for that so it's a lot of decisions a lot of big decisions because the truth is any serious crime in our country you will prosecute that's not the case when you're investigating a war or a widespread human rights abuse not every individual is going to receive individualized justice and that is what we would all like um, but, or if they are, you may not be able to deliver it and it may be many years down the line and mm -hmm. it's telling people that and it, it's coping with that and knowing that you've done enough at the end of the day. Thank you. I'm just going to pick up on one question that's come up from the chat box before going on to the um, political influence issue. And this is just somebody was asking was what in your view, you mentioned funding of the courts. So mm. what in your view would be the best way to fund some of these courts? And they're also interested in effective um, recording of witness statements. Okay, those are two completely different matters, but um, I won't deal with the effective recording of witness statements. What I, what I will say is, if you're investigating sexual crimes, I missed this out, um, there's the international protocol, which is very helpful in that regard. Um, in relation to funding, I mean, the ICC model is good. 
I think you have to look at each case. If you can have an investigative mechanism and then have local courts prosecuting, great. That's not always possible. Um, in terms of what's cost effective, having international prosecutors coming in or advising your domestic system, that's cost effective. Um, having the ICC set up and funded by everybody is great, but of course it's massively underfunded to do the entire um, world and it's subject to political whims as to whether it gets the funding and, and such like. So uh, I think in terms of funding, you, you have to look at the model in Special Tribunal for Lebanon. It was done. The worst thing is donors. Uh, Special Tribunal for Lebanon, the only people who didn't pay or paid late were um, the Lebanese, but in re which can just stop your investigation because you have no budget. But in Cambodia, they kept on starting and stopping because that was all done by no donations and that, that was enormously problematic. Um, but there's no right solution. I like having a in permanent international court to do the very highest of crimes. I, I wish it was better funded. Um, but money depends on political will. And insofar as you can things, do things in national systems, that's helpful. So in terms of political influence, um, to what extent is that working on the international courts or? Okay, well, let's, let's be realistic. The crimes we're talking about are politically motivated crimes. That, that's what we're talking about. At least politically motivated, if not political crimes, which the crime progression is. So that is the world you're dealing with. Now, of course, the prosecutors, they don't, the policy of the International Criminal Court and most prosecutors take a whole situation, which means you look at all parties. So for example, if you took Syria, you would look at um, ISIS, you look at Assad, you look at um, the Kurds, you look at everyone, which is why the ICC is almost certainly never going to be given jurisdiction um, for Syria. But that's, that's what you're dealing with. So there are various ways it, it can influence. Well, firstly, if it's an international court, especially if it's a ad hoc, somebody's funding you. So to get the next round of funding, you can all guess that by a certain date, there will be indictments because without those indictments, there will be no funding. Um, so certainly that has an impact, which is good because when you're investigating something as big as um, what the STL had jurisdiction over or the Kosovo chambers or the ICTY, you can investigate forever. And if you don't have that pressure to push you, there's so much you could keep adding to that indictment, um, it would take even longer and these, these courts take long enough as they do. Um, so certainly um, the politics affects the money, which affects the timing. Um, I would say certain campaigns, for example, in relation to prioritization of sexual violence has meant they're more likely to be considered on the indictment. For example, at the ICC, they've got a big push in relation to sexual violence. And there's the current trial um, going on, which is the first trial for persecution on the basis of gender, which is very interesting. And that is probably because of an ongoing political awareness and push in relation to sexual and gender-based crimes. Um, and so effectively they can affect the timing and the focus, but they can also affect jurisdiction. So for example, if you look at the ICC, um, in 2005, Palestine, no, 15, Palestine um, was able to sign and join the Rome Statute. That resulted in um, a pre-investigation and the current case, well, the current stage of proceedings in front of the ICC in relation to Palestine. And that was obviously impacted by other states recognizing Palestine as a state. And so that is important because it can affect jurisdiction. So, and then equally, of course, if you, are going to be vetoed um, when people try and put together a motion as they did for the ICTY or the ICTR or a referral to the ICC, uh, politics can just stop your jurisdiction that way. So those are 
all the ways politics affects what you're doing. And of course, if you want to extradite somebody, if you want to go somewhere, if you want to do something, um, politics impacts it. For example, the current US action against the ICC and the fact that no staff member or their families can go to the US. Well, if witnesses are there, uh, that would be problematic. So politics influences what you're doing. Um, there's the provision at the ICC to even stop investigations if there's a peace process ongoing. And you're working in a political realm in a way that you don't or you shouldn't be in uh, national investigations. But these are political crimes um, and the people you're investigating are often extremely powerful. And that's the reality of the situation. OK, thank you. That's, that's a fantastic overview. I know it's an enormous area that you're, you're trying to cover for us and we've got lots of different questions coming at quite different angles. But I, I want to start with the one um, that I sent you that we got in advance actually about Israel from Stephen Valentine, um, which was whether you think that UN sanctions against Israel are possible if there's an annexation of the West Bank. Um, just one of you can comment on that. Well, um... Looking at, at the question, no, the US will veto it, is the short answer. Um, but there was another question, uh, if you can ask that related and I'll, okay. I'll, I'll wind them in together. Great, so, so that one was um, whether the international community realistically um, can respond to the Israeli annexation. Yeah, okay. So firstly, there is an ongoing case at the ICC, it doesn't relate to annexation, but it, it relates to Israeli action in Palestine, um, which is now a uh, signatory to the Rome Statute, which gives um, the ICC jurisdiction over what occurs in Palestine. Um, it could be said that the annexation, actually along with the blockading of courts, etc., constitutes the crime of aggression, um, which if you look at 8 bis, um, would give the International Criminal Court jurisdiction without any sort of Security Council resolution. But that's subject to litigation. The pretrial chamber will have to see what happens there. Uh, a judgment's expected any time, it's very exciting. Um, now, a lot is being done by the international community, but we need to recognize that there are certain countries with a huge amount of power. And this isn't really international criminal law, it's politics. In terms of what people are doing, there are human rights organizations doing a great deal, um, including Israeli Jewish human rights organizations. Um, there is condemnation, there are declarations of what the law is, but in terms of political action, U UN sanctions, no, the US are going to veto it. Um, other countries could impose sanctions unilaterally, but when their trading partner is the US, and the US, of course, is not the only people Israel are friends with. They have a lot of international friends. So unfortunately, I'm not a politician, um, but the reality is that if you want progress there, you have to have a moderate um, Israeli leader and a moderate US leader, and we have neither. We have President Trump and Netanyahu, who are not moderate, um, individuals known for compromising. Okay, thank you. I'm going to group together a few questions we've got about witnesses now. Um, so they are uh, quite distinct issues. What, obviously somebody's quite interested in the way in which you store the information, the, the kind of actual process. Um, there's also the query about how witnesses, vulnerable witnesses, protected. Um, if, if you, if you, you mentioned uh, this to me before. And thirdly, somebody is asking about um, how per what, what you do in terms of personal data on servers that may be in other territories. So again, kind okay. of trying to get information about the witnesses that way. So different courts have different protocols. Um, but for example, at the ICY, the ICC, um, generally witnesses date details were not released until a certain period before they give evidence. So um, 
that's one protection and you could have witness anonymity orders. So what, what the process would often be, you'd go and take a statement, you'd put it on often a network in your country, let's say the, uh, let's say it's in the Hague, and that means you'd have to physically be in the building to access it. Um, they're often video recorded, um, they're usually encrypted whilst they're traveling, um, they're usually kept very secure. Um, now, if that witness is being used, you will always speak to that witness before, you will talk to them about the disclosure of their details and the impact, and you will normally do a risk assessment as to uh, the impact of them. And if they're an expert witness, like a statistician or a DNA person sitting in London, that risk assessment will be a lot less thorough than if they're an insider witness talking against the government, obviously. So in terms of witness protection, there are various ways. You, you can look at it and you can decide the witness isn't at risk. You can take anonymity or other protective measures. Um, and for the very highest, most important people, you can put them in a physical witness protection program. And, and there are different forms of anonymity. For example, just not disclosing their names to the public is, is quite normal um, and not making their testimony. There are various ways you can close the court. Um, but realistically, there are very few witness protection places and um, it's a very hard scheme to go into. So those are reserved for very few witnesses and very few witnesses are psychologically able to deal with various things that happen, like you need to cut off entirely from your family if they're not coming with you, uh, from your culture. It's, it's a very difficult process. Um, does that answer all of the questions? It's yeah, yes, I think that, that I think that does cover some of the main points. Thank you. Um, so uh, I'll, um, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll skip back to the European Union um, rule of law issue, mission in Kosovo, and somebody has asked um, about yeah. criticisms from Judge Malcolm Simmons. And um, I don't know if you're familiar with those. And, and, and um, whether I, I know Malcolm Simmons very well, and I'm afraid I'm not going to comment on okay. um, those um, because there's always two sides to a story. And um, I can't remember how much is public and how much is confidential. So I'm afraid I'm going to pass on that one. That's absolutely fine. I've also got oh, a, um, a, a quite a group of questions about careers and how to... Um, move on with international careers but I'm going to leave that to the end. Oh, and right. and there's one... fear. I want this in office. I think everyone needs to be on mute if you put them all on mute. You know. um, so there's one other quite long question. I'm not sure that this might be one that you prefer to have a think about and we could perhaps go back to this personal afterwards um, but it's someone who's a trustee for a UK based re registered charity and they're working with Rohingya refugees in New okay. Delhi. And they're saying that most of the members of the camp still have families in Myanmar and uh, they continue to continue to witness atrocities. And it's just saying, what what would you think would be the best way to assist victims when charities can't get into the state? Any? Mm. Well, there are. No, no, no it, it's fine. Um, let me let me put it this way. The International Investigative Mechanism for Myanmar and other UN investigative bodies have, are working with these communities. And I would say the best thing is to refer it to them because you have prosecutors and international investigatives with experience um, of dealing with these situations. We obviously are used to dealing with some people out of the country, some people in wars going on and investigating. You have, um, they have political and local contacts and uh, I don't want to say anything that would put anyone in danger but referring them to that mechanism and getting individualized advice on that particular situation as how they can behave and how their their family can behave without putting themselves at risk which may involve doing nothing it depends um, is the best thing to do. And, and given this is being recorded, I, I don't want to say any more than that, but I'd be happy to uh, discuss on a, I'm happy for you to give that person my email and I, I can discuss it on a more private basis. 
Okay, that, that's very kind, thank you. Um, so I'm going to just wind up the main discussion really with um, a couple of comments people have made, which is, it, uh, do you sometimes feel like you're a losing battle just because of the volume of things that are going on? And also someone's asking, um, because of uh, some countries not recognising the results of the judgment, what, what's the meaning of the ICC? What, what, what do you really feel is worthwhile about it? Well, sorry, what was the first question again? So it, it was just whether you feel you're on a losing battle just because of the volume. So we, we, could, we could all say that with, with all jobs, but if you look at the impact of the Srebrenica and the, the Mladic judgment, if you look at um, a lot of what happens, it, it makes a difference. And, and if you save one life, if you help one person come to contact into to terms of what's happening. Uh, and often it takes a long time. For example, I was prosecuting the second and the third rapes of war crime in Kosovo, but the president set up a committee and people are talking and the community is beginning to heal and more work is being done. So. Quite often what happens takes time, but also international criminal law might not work in to deter people in some circumstances, but it may have reduced the use of chemical weapons in Syria. It certainly impacts how Western troops behave because uh, they know there are accountability mechanisms. So it, it does make a difference. But it, it's like being a police officer in any country, you, you won't eradicate crime, but you can give people justice in some instances, and you um, can deter to a large extent, nothing is perfect. Um, in terms of the ICC and recognition, people turn up eventually, people get tried, situations get declared, you know, people, it takes 10 years, it takes 20 years sometimes, but their work is important and international work is important and it is a slower time scale but eventually generally politics change and whether it's through that mechanism or something uh, more local or more transit transitional um or more conciliatory communities have to heal and if you can in any way help and take part in that or help in holding somebody to justice and helping the community understand what's happened, that's worth something. Okay, thank you very much. And so um, finally, I'd like you just to uh, discuss how you get into this um, unique area of law. Obviously, lots of people are criminal lawyers, but there's, there's the issue of actually accessing international law. How would you recommend people make that transfer? So, so there's, there's two things. There's well, at the Lebanon Tribunal, we had two types of international lawyers. Um, what we used to call the pointy hat lawyers, which are the very clever people with PhDs in international law as a rule. And they often work with the judges, but there's also a special section in all OTPs to deal with the really clever legal arguments, which um, don't relate to the evidence or the procedure or very much. They're just very clever legal arguments, people with degrees, right? Um, or if you want to be a trial lawyer. Now, if you want to be the first, go get yourself a massive PhD, do an internship, um, end up at one of these big international law um, at, at The Hague. And that's the one side, and that's if you want to work with judges, if, if you want to be a theoretical, a theoretical lawyer, but drafting practical arguments, for example, about jurisdiction and such like. If you want to be a trial lawyer, uh, which is what I consider myself. Um, firstly, you have to somehow get your foot in the door, but I would say you need five years domestic experience. Now, there are various ways of doing that. One way, if you can afford it or if you can get a scholarship, is after you've trained, do an internship for some time, then go and get your domestic experience. Uh, it doesn't matter, defence counsel, judges, prosecutor, but get five years of domestic experience. That wasn't what I did. And I had a good degree from Cambridge, et cetera, but I applied about five years in for a few things through IBAR and the ICC, and I didn't get them because I didn't have my foot in the door. The other way to do it is to go somewhere not very nice where not many people with proper professional organizations want to do. Now, you may say Kosovo wasn't so bad. It really wasn't. 
but it's not The Hague, it's not Geneva, it's not New York. So quite often the thing to do is to go to somewhere that is perceived as a hardship station for a year, two years, get the experience, get the contacts, and then if you are desperate to go to The Hague, fine. Although you may make a lot more difference and find it a lot more satisfying to be in country in one of the other mechanisms. So it's good to have the experience, but I would say those are the two ways. Either you do an internship earlier, early, which involves money, um, or go somewhere which isn't um, perceived as being very nice, having got yourself five years of really useful, practical criminal experience. And it helps obviously to have languages. Now, I was lucky the Kosovo mission was in English. It's one of the main languages of international criminal law, French, Spanish, Arabic, all very helpful, but you need to be fully fluent. That's absolutely super. Thank you, Diana. I'm going to bring it to an end there and just say to everybody that obviously Diana is um, from Nine Bedford Row. She's on LinkedIn and she's also written a um, really excellent blog um, about the situation in Black Lives Matters in the States and whether there could be a crime against humanity and it has, I, I think deliberately um, placed it there for discussion. So if anybody's interested in looking at that and engaging, um, do please go ahead. But thank you very much for joining us. Bye. Thank you.